Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Welcome to the Unknown Bible, the broadcast ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. Join us now for today's Bible study with our pastor, Bevan Zwelder. We have put together for you a three broadcast series on marriage. This first broadcast is going to be on a spiritually good marriage, the emphasis on the spiritual matters. And then the next broadcast is going to be on a practically good marriage, and it's going to emphasize practical things in the marriage that will make it stronger. And then the last broadcast is going to be on a mutually good marriage, and in that broadcast, we will concentrate on some things that husbands can do and some things that wives can do to strengthen the marriage. So today we'll start with a spiritually good marriage, and we're going to deal, obviously, then with spiritual matters that are in the foundation of the marriage. That is, a marriage that is established on a good spiritual foundation. Now, you can probably think of a number of things spiritually that will strengthen a marriage. We are going to just concentrate on five of these things. In that way, we can spend enough time on each of them to hopefully clarify in your mind the importance of these. A spiritually good marriage requires, first of all, salvation. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39, we're dealing with a situation where a woman has been married and her husband has died, and now she wants to remarry. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 39, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will. Watch it. Only in the Lord. The reason we picked this verse is not so that we can just deal with a widow or a widower. It emphasizes the importance of the last part of that verse in marriage, only in the Lord. She is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. You see, to have a spiritually good marriage, it's very important, obviously, that both the husband and the wife are in the Lord. You see, there's trouble enough in marriage already without complicating it by having one spouse saved and the other spouse unsaved. I mean, in that case, uh, they'd be better off not being married. Now, I realize there are some marriages where you have a saved man and an unsaved woman, saved woman, unsaved man. They, they got together and they got married, and you see the marriage, and you look at him and say, I believe they're happy. But we're talking about a good marriage and one that is spiritually good. It's impossible for them to have a spiritually good marriage. Generally, they won't go to church together. If they do, they go to a church that doesn't preach the gospel, and they can't rely upon together those spiritual things that are available to you and me in the Bible, in prayer, in our relationship with God, to get help when they need it, you see. Every marriage is going to have trouble, and, and it gets more complicated when only one of the spouses is married. Now you say, well, how do I avoid that possibility? The, the way to avoid that possibility, if you're not married now, is to not date people who are not saved. You know, the problem, the problem with Bible-believing Christians is that, generally speaking, they're in smaller churches, and so they don't see uh, in, the, in the boys and girls that are in the church, they generally don't see the person that they want to marry. And, and so, consequently, they're thinking, well, if, if I have to wait on God here, I'm going to be waiting until I'm old and gray. 
because I don't see anybody here that qualifies and and they're ready to date. And so they get they get nervous about that. And what they do is they go to school, they find somebody that's cute or attractive or handsome. And and they strike up a relationship. Next thing they know, their their heart has led past their mind. Uh, they, they were determined not to marry or date somebody that was lost. But, you know, after all, this person is interested in them and they're interested in this person. And so next thing you know, they're dating. The, the dating now has gotten, uh, you know, more interesting, more intense. And now suddenly there's talk of marriage. And, and one of the one of the people's not saved. I'm telling you, <laughs> that's a real big problem. And you want to avoid that problem? Then don't date people who are not saved. You say, well, what should I do? You know, there are times, I'm not recommending that you do this either, but there are times when what you do is you pray, you wait, you don't get involved in that dating relationship. You're more soul conscious than you are physical conscious. And, and what happens is, a lot of times people will get saved and they start coming to church and growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and then you find out this person becomes a, a suitable spouse. You don't start the dating relationship and then try to get them to church so they can get saved so y'all can get married. You start concerning yourself, first of all, with their salvation, not with dating. And then, and then see if it doesn't develop after salvation. You understand? Now, if you're already married and your spouse is not saved, then you then you should follow 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 13 to 16. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 13, the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband, else were your children unclean. But now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. But God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? The point being that if you're in a, if you're in a marriage now, and one of you saved and one of you not, then what do you do? What you do is you, you if you're the saved spouse, should be very faithful in attending to the things of the Lord. You should read your Bible, you should pray, and you should go to church. Now, the truth is, often, this isn't the case. What happens, the safe spouse usually circs his or her responsibilities to the Lord in order to keep peace in the marriage. And that's not going to have a good spiritual effect on your marriage. I know several instances where people were married, they weren't saved, one spouse got saved, became very faithful in church. Listen, didn't didn't force uh, church on the rest of the family, didn't preach every day trying to force everybody to get saved, just started growing in his or her own relationship with the Lord. And you know what happened? Others in the family began to ca catch on. Look, uh, dad's a better person. He is uh, he's very faithful to the church. I wonder what's going on over there. And I, I tell you, I've watched spouses who are faithful in their attendance, faithful in praying, faithful in Bible reading. Within two years, oftentimes the other spouse is saved, children are saved, and they're growing. And I mean, they are doing well. So a spiritually good marriage, first of all, requires salvation. The people need to be saved. If you're in a marriage and neither one of you is saved, I'll tell you what. Go get a Bible, read it. And get into a good Bible preaching, Bible believing church and hear the gospel preached and let Jesus Christ save you and change who you are. It'll change what you do. You'll become a child of God. God will get in the middle of that relationship. And I'm telling you, he'll do things in the marriage that were virtually impossible to you and absolutely impossible to you without his help. So get saved. And if you're saved, live for Jesus. And, and if you're not married yet, don't, don't start dating unsaved people. Just don't do it. All right. Secondly, a spiritual, a spiritually good marriage not only requires salvation, a spiritually good marriage requires fellowship with Jesus Christ. Fellowship with Jesus Christ. First John, first John chapter one and verse three, first John chapter one and verse three, uh, 
John is writing and he's telling us about his relationship with the Lord. He says that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you. That ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the father and with his son Jesus Christ. All right. A spiritually good marriage requires fellowship with Jesus Christ. I mean, in other words, it's one thing to be saved. And yet it's another thing altogether to be in fellowship with the Lord. There are saved couples who struggle more than they should in their marriages because Jesus Christ is not at the center of their relationship. In other words, they're saved. Hey, you know, they grew up in church and said, don't marry anybody that's not saved. And they found somebody who was a nominal Christian, saved, not really, you know, growing in the Lord. So there's somebody and they get married and then they don't grow. They don't have any fellowship with Jesus Christ. Their relationship with the Lord is stagnant. They're not growing. They're not growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, you know what happens there? The, the marriage suffers as a result. Jesus Christ is not at the center of the relationship. And Jesus Christ should be at the center. And Jesus Christ should be at the head of your marriage. Now imagine a pyramid. And on this picture that you have in your mind of a pyramid, Jesus Christ is at the head. He's the chief cornerstone. He's up at the top. And each spouse, this is a two-dimensional triangle, really. Each spouse is in one of the corners. Let's say the husband over in the left corner, wife over in the right corner. Now watch it. Jesus is at the head. Spouses are down in each corner. Watch it. The closer that each spouse gets to the Lord, the closer they will be to each other. Do you understand? Because the base of the triangle is shrinking as they get closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Imagine that they are just, you know, one inch from the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're going to just be one inch from each other. And they get closer and closer to each other as you get closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do we do that? It's very simple. Have devotions together. In other words, prayer ought to be a part of your family more than just praying over meals. Bible discussions, Bible reading ought to be part of your family. If you, if you struggle to try to read together, then each read separately and talk about these matters from time to time. Spend time together in fellowship with the Lord. I mean, enjoy your relationship with the Lord. Grow in your relationship with the Lord and grow in your relationship with each other. Uh, just being saved is not enough to make a spiritually strong marriage, uh, a marriage where the people are saved and growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ is one that is going to be absolutely, absolutely uh, strong and good. Okay. A spiritually good marriage then requires salvation and fellowship with Jesus Christ and requires something else. A spiritually good marriage requires, and it's very important, Fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. We're going to spend some time here uh, throughout these three broadcasts. Ephesians 5, 21 says this. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then he goes right into the responsibilities of wives and husbands throughout the rest of the chapter. Ephesians chapter 5, submitting yourselves one to another. Watch it. In the fear of God. A spiritually good marriage requires fear of God. That's right. Why? Because the, the marriage at some point is going to go through intense pressure. And a spiritually good marriage will survive that intense pressure when the spouses fear God and don't divorce. You see, when you fear God, you obey him. You read, you see what the Bible says. The Bible shows you clearly that God is against divorce. Divorce is easy. Divorce is legal. But just because it's easy and just because it's legal doesn't mean it's right. When you fear God, you obey him and you look to him rather than men to fix your problems. And God can fix your problems better than anyone else in the world. God-fearing couples go through trouble. Just like couples who don't fear God. However, God-fearing couples get through trouble because they fear the Lord. 
I mean, the difficulties that should destroy them in a strange way, but very factually, make them stronger. And it's the fear of the Lord that keeps them together through their difficulties. Uh, every marriage endures stresses. Every marriage endures strains. I believe that those stresses and strains, those pressures, those trials, those difficulties are the ingredients that strengthen your commitment to each other if you can survive them. And I believe the way to survive them is through the fear of God. In the fear of God, you know, you, in the fear of God, you don't say things to or against your spouse that you would say if you didn't fear him because you fear God. You don't take actions in the fear of God that you would take if you didn't fear God. Now, I'll give you an interesting little story, and then we'll move on to the next, the next uh, principle, or the next thing in the foundation. When, when I got called to preach, I was in the banking business. And my wife will say, I was married to a banker. And when I submitted to the call of God in my life to leave the bank and enter the ministry full time, that was a very difficult time for my wife. If, if my wife were the one speaking now instead of, instead of me, she would tell you that six months before I left the bank, we had a conversation about what she would think if I decided to change careers. I was being a little, a little coy here. And she said, I know what you're thinking about doing. You're thinking about going into the ministry. And if you were to go into the ministry, I'd hit you in the head with a skillet. And you got to understand she was holding a cast iron skillet. She was absolutely opposed to that. Well, we spent a lot more time praying about it. I, I did a lot of praying about it. Didn't discuss it anymore. Six months later, it was just absolutely irresistible. I knew I had to, to, to go. Uh, uh, the Lord was really calling me into the ministry full time. And so I told her then, I said, you know, I'm going to resign the bank in a couple of weeks. The Lord's really, really dealing with me about the ministry. And she giggled and she said, you know, I knew it was coming and I thought it would be next month. Now, God really did a work in her heart. And then a few months later, I said, now we're going to sell our house, pack our stuff. We're moving to Florida and I'm going to Bible college. And she was like, what? Man, she really did not want to do that. As a matter of fact, if she were talking now, she would tell you that she seriously contemplated whether she should leave me. And you know what? She didn't give it another thought for one reason. Well, two, but I'll give you one. One reason. And that reason is she feared God. The other reason is she was pregnant with our fourth child and she thought, what man would want? <laughs> you know the rest of the story. Anyway, we survived that, and we survived it through the fear of God. Boy, we, didn't, we weren't perfect in the way we handled our decisions. I'll grant you that. But because of the fear of God, we kept doing what God told us and showed us to do in the Bible. We trusted Him. And I'll tell you what, God fixed us through the stresses and strains and pressures and difficulties and trials that we endured, and we are still happily married and strong in that relationship because of that fear of God. A spiritually good marriage requires salvation, fellowship with Jesus Christ, fear of God, and then something else, contentment, contentment. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, it's vital to your marriage that you learn to be content in your relationship with Jesus Christ. I've seen that marriages often collapse because one spouse or the other is not content. Now, this may be a real shocker to you, but get this. It is not the duty of your spouse to make you happy. It is not the duty of your spouse to make you content. A lot of people get married and they say, well, I want to make you happy. And the other says, I want my wife or my husband to make me happy. Or he makes me happy. And that's why we got married. I'm going to tell you something. That is not solid ground. That ground is, is sand. Solid ground is a rock. 
And that rock is contentment in your relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's where contentment comes from. It's something that comes with godliness. It's something that comes from your relationship to Jesus Christ. What happens is you become content on the inside and worldly gain doesn't impress you. Uh, the grass is not greener on the other side. You're not carried away with the lust of the flesh. You see, the strongest marriages are the ones where each spouse is godly and each spouse is content and they're so happy in their relationship with the Lord, they're not looking for additional happiness from somebody else. If you are and you're in a situation where your husband or your wife is not making you happy right now, you'd be tempted to look somewhere else for another husband or another wife. And that's not good. The strongest marriages are the ones where each spouse is godly and content. That combination of godliness and contentment is what yields the greatest gain individually and mutually in the marriage. Now, if you're not content, if you don't have contentment, you get that and you get that from the Lord. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you, when your heart changes and you are content, your heart will change towards your spouse. I told my wife on our 33rd anniversary, I said, the things you do that used to annoy me are now the things that make me laugh. She didn't change. I changed. What changed me? I became content in my relationship with Jesus Christ and very satisfied with his provision of that dear woman that I call my wife. A spiritually good marriage requires salvation, fellowship with Jesus Christ, Fear of the Lord, contentment, and one other thing, and this is very practical, but it's very spiritual. Church attendance. That's right. Church attendance. Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25 says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Well, you know the day of the return of the Lord is getting closer, obviously. And so much the more, the Bible says, as you see the day approaching, and we, what is that that we should do? Assembling of ourselves together. He said, don't forsake it. And you know, marriages often crumble. They start out in church, then they get away from church, and then they fight and they fuss, so they can't find the solution, and they break apart. Listen, you must regularly and faithfully be under the preaching and teaching of God's words. That's right. A spiritually good marriage is strengthened in a good church. So be sure that you are active in a Bible teaching, Bible preaching, Bible believing church. Because anything short of Bible believing, Bible teaching, Bible preaching, you know what it is? It's a religious social club, and it won't do you much good. Listen, in your marriage right now, if you and your husband or you and your wife are not in church, and your marriage is weak and, and getting weaker, then, then listen carefully. Consider your heart. Are you saved? Are you saved? I mean, some people say, well, I, I, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid in a youth camp. That's, that may not be salvation. There are people who have gotten saved certainly doing that. Salvation is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, not saying a prayer and inviting Jesus into your heart. Um, so so i got to ask you, check your salvation. Check your spouse's salvation. That could be a, a real problem in the core of your relationship. How's your fellowship with Jesus Christ? Do you spend any time with him at all, or do you just get up, you know, as soon as the alarm clock gets off, and, and then you go through your normal routine until you get home, and then you fuss and you fight, and you eat your supper, and some days are good, and some days aren't so good, and you go to bed and get up, do it all over again. How's your fellowship with Jesus Christ? You say, well, it's non-existent. Then you need to start having fellowship with Jesus Christ. Get, get together with your spouse and, and spend some time together in fellowship with the Lord in the Bible and in prayer. How about the fear of the Lord? You say, well, I don't even know what the Lord has told me that I should do in my marriage and shouldn't do in my marriage. I'll tell you, marriages collapse when people don't fear God. God said, uh-uh, I hate divorce. 
And listen, when you fear God, you will go to the Bible. You will find the wisdom of God in that Bible, and you will do what he said. And when you listen, when you do in your marriage what God says, the way God says it, your marriage gets better. How is your contentment? You say, I'm not happy at all. Well, then start with, listen, not going to the bar to get a beer, not going to the movie to entertain yourself, not spending more money on a vacation trying to, you know, inject a little happiness into your relationship. Get on your knees and beg God to help you become godly and to give you contentment in your godliness. And you, in that, you will find great gain. Doesn't cost you a dime, but it sure takes some time. And then when you have contentment inside of you and not not from the outside sources of television and your internet activity and the funny things you do and the folks you hang around with, but from Jesus Christ, that will change your life. And then, and then take a look at your church attendance. Are you just sporadic? Do you even have a good church? Or do you just go where they have a concert from time to time? Uh, or do you go where you really get some Bible teaching, really get some Bible preaching, really get some good sound doctrine of, upon which you can grow? You say, well, no, I tell you, he says, you know what? We are saved and we have a little fellowship with Jesus, but we don't fear God, not content at all. And no, we hadn't been in church in a pretty good while. Well, let me tell you what you need to do. <laughs> Sunday is right around the corner. You know what you need to do Saturday night? You need to go ahead and pick out what clothes you're going to wear. Make the decision. You're going to get up in time to be able to get your breakfast cooked and calculate how long it's going to take you to get to church and Leave your house sufficiently in time to get there. Take your Bible with you and then sit down and pray to God that he'll give you something out of the preaching and teaching of the word of God that'll help you get closer to Jesus and help you get closer to your spouse and help you to get stronger in your marriage. I tell you what, you put those ingredients in your marriage and you will have a spiritually good marriage. Now, remember, remember, no quick fixes here. It took time for you to get in the shape you're in. It'll take you time to get things back on track again. Just be patient and do the right things. Stay close to Jesus. And God bless you when you do. Amen. You have been listening to The Unknown Bible, the radio ministry of Bible Believers Baptist Church in Corpus Christi, Texas. For information about our church, go to our church website at www.my3bc.com. That's my, the number three, bc.com. If you would like to contact us by telephone, our number is 361-241-6100. Bible Believers Baptist Church is a Bible-believing church located at 1701 Rand Morgan Road. If you are not currently a member of a Bible-believing church and you are looking for a church with an uncompromising stand on the words of God, come visit with us this Sunday or Wednesday. We would love to see you. Hallelujah.